Once highly valued, al Madri, an Islamic-based schooling system, is now being denounced and portrayed by some as a breeding ground for societal misfits and perpetuation of poverty and illiteracy in northern Nigeria. Some citizens and politicians, often in the mainstream, suggest that al Madri schools are ideological conduits for insurgents that facilitate the recruitment of insurgents and create constituency for ethno-religiously motivated riots and violence. These concerns have elicited a response from the highest levels of government. The National Security Advisor to President Buhari stated last year, quote, the problems, the problems we face today are rooted in the fact that a lot of people who have been denied the opportunity to get a formal ed education end up becoming criminals, drug addicts, and so on and so forth. They end up becoming tools and to be used by elements in wider society who have very dangerous intentions. And therefore, it is very important to prescribe certain groups ultimately running around under the guise of maybe getting some kind of education that is not really formal and then begin to cause a lot of problems for society." End quote. Mangano added that, that is the National Security Advisor, added that, quote, the group I spoke about on illiteracy is the al -Majri. Ultimately, government will have to proscribe the al phenomenon because we cannot continue to have street urchins, children roaming around only for them in a couple of years or decades to become a problem for society." End quote. Today, al and the al has been banned in northern Nigeria based on such dominant negative characterizations. Sentiments we will debate and interrogate in our live conversation alongside my co-host today, Dr. Jalili Ghana Adibi. Welcome to Leaders of Africa Live. Leaders of Africa Live is interactive. Share your voice on YouTube and in the Zoom using the link found on leadersofafrica.org slash live or tweet using the hashtag, hashtag Leaders Africa Live. Click on to subscribe to our new uh, YouTube channel to also get alerts as well. Let us know where you are joining us from. Select comments and call-ins will be shared today live and our panelists will respond. We may be all in different locations around the globe, but we are all here to have a very important conversation today. Before we introduce our panelists, just a little bit of background for us. And I want to start with the data from Afrobarometer about formal education in Nigeria. The data according to Afrobarometer in the year of 2017, the last time the survey was done, Nigerians' assessment of formal education services is mixed, with some citizens suggesting that education is improving, whereas others questioning the government's record in some states. In particular, citizens in many northern states indicated that the government's policy and the government's was generally performing well. This leads credence to support for a national education policy. But in comparison to other African countries, Nigerians are much more critical of educational delivery and policy at the country level. But these figures do not directly reflect the debate over the Amadri system and the educational system we're going to be talking about today. This has been debated more publicly and, and rehearsed through a number of events, often centered around politicians supporting the banner, banning of al Madri schools. That said, we received many pictures and videos ahead of today's conversation, including from, uh, including from Malam Abbas from Niger State in Nigeria, suggesting that the al Madri system must be maintained in some form. Let's hear his voice. al Majranti will not be a solution in Nigeria. It may in other way be a means of the thriving a right to education for those people affected. What I think is the government shall come up with plans that the al Majranti will be for form in Nigeria. Hello. We've also heard from we've also heard from Ibrahim Sunni, who also shares a very similar opinion. The national <clears throat> local government, Sokoto State, Nigeria. As for me, the issue of Al Majiri system in Africa, 
uh, is very necessary. Almajiri is a child like any other child in the world. So why talking of uh, banning them? They have every right to survive like any other child in the world. How old are you? And we also received messages from those who are supporting in terms of the education in the context of our Madri system from many NGOs that are working with those in a Madri schools. Let's take a look at this. How old are you? How old are you? I am 16 years old. 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 Where are you from? 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 I am from Kaduna. I am from Kaduna. I am from Kaduna. But as we can see, many of these uh, discussions that have happened up till now have focused uh, mainly on politicians. But we know that you have a voice. And today's session is about your voice, the broader voice, the broader perspectives on the issue. And so we now want, I want to introduce my co-host here. And let's bring him in. Uh, my co-host here, Dr. Jalili Ghana Adibi, uh, who is also going to introduce our panelists today to comment on some of the things that we've seen, as well as uh, some of the larger issues that we're going to talk about today. I, I leave it off to you, Ghana. Uh, thank you, Professor Peter, for the hope now. Uh, today we are joined by Honorable Aisha Tuduku, uh, who is presently the National Assembly member from Gumi State, representing Duku in the Father Federal Constituency. Honorable Aisha Tuduku was Minister of State for Education between 2010 and 2010 under the presidency of late President Umar Musa Yaradwa. Honorable Aisha, to welcome to our program today. Thank you very much. Good to have you. Thank you. We are also joined by Dr. Adisa Kere Abdurrahman, a faculty member at Bishop Bruce State University in the United Kingdom. Adisa is from Niger State and a highly run scholar on Almajri and Almajranshi. Welcome. Dr. Adisa Abdurrahman Kere. Thank you very much, Dr. Adibi. Thank you. We are happy to have you today. Next, we have Honorable Dr. Balarabi Shewu Kakali, who is a highly and highly ranked member of the National Assembly from Kuna State, representing Biring Bari Giwa Federal Constituency. Honorable Shewu Balarabi Kakali, welcome to our program today. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jalili. Uh, uh, I had a little, a bit of freeze. I'm not sure whether you mentioned my constituency well. We can hear you. So, uh, yeah, I th oh, yeah, we can hear you perfectly. So uh, you are representing Bini Buari Giwa Federal Constituency. Is that right? No, 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 no. It's Bodenga Bengishuni Tureta of Sokoto State. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you so much. of Sokoto State, yes. Sokoto Thank you. Thank you. We regret the uh, inaccuracy. And lastly, we have Dr. Yeah, there is Anna one I think that's the yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Honorable. Lastly, we have Dr. Anna Ushena from uh, the University of East Angelia in the United Kingdom as well. Anna completed a doctoral degree at the University of Oxford. She produced studies and documentaries that provide empirical evidence that dismiss the stereotype about Qurani school and al Majiranshi in Nigeria. Dr. Anna, welcome on board today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. So I'm going to ask the, the first question here. And it actually comes from a comment we received on the pre uh, conversation survey before we talked uh, uh, today. Um, and and Mohammed is writing in to say that we should have entitled today's uh, event Understanding the Al Manjaransi in Nigeria before talking about facts, myths, and misrepresentations. So let's start there in our conversation. This, this, I, I like this word, understanding. Um, and so to you, uh, uh, Hadiza, 
Um, what should we know about the Almadjeranci system and the Almadri? What you know, particularly for those of us that may not be familiar or fr not from Nigeria, what what should we know as a first starting place to understanding the Almadri and the Almadjeranci system? I actually like this question very much, and I completely agree with him. We should have taken it back and tried to understand the Almadjeranci system. Because I think part of the problem that the system faces is a lot of misunderstanding. It's a, 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 misunderstood a lot. Um, I think let's take it back. Let's take it back to its origin. It started about around the 11th century in the Kanem Borno Empire. And then by the turn of the 18th century, 19th century, with the coming of um, Danfodio and everything, it kind of became even more prominent. I think the issues that the Almadjeranci system started having came when the colonialists came to Nigeria. So Nigeria is a former British colony between 1900 and 1960. And that was really when Almadjeranci began to suffer. The support that it received at community level began to be affected by new colonial laws and rules that just disenfranchised it. Almadjeranci is not unique to northern Nigeria. It's a common system of education all across Muslim West Africa. It's a traditional Quranic system. I don't like to use the word traditional because that sets it against modernity. It's a classical system of Quranic education across Muslim right. West Africa. And it sees young boys sent away from home to live with a malam to disciple, to apprentice in knowledge. The Quran is the major text of study, but that's not the only thing they study. So not only is it a system of education, it's also a system of socialization, mainly for boys. And I think in trying to understand it, that's one of the things I'd like to say. Another thing I'd really like to clarify is today, al is often misunderstood with begging. al has become another word for beggar two different things. There are many beggars on the streets of northern Nigeria. Not all of them are al -Majiri. Absolutely. Ghana, over to you. I mean, thank you so much, Adisa, for that. And uh, uh, so the next question uh, will be posed to Honorable Aisha Tuduku. And this question naturally builds up on the response of uh, Dr. Adisa. Uh, they are seeing mainstream qualification of al -Majiri as out-of-school children and as big meat that uh, Dr. Adisa seems to be discounting. So Dr. Uh, Honorable Aisha, too, is this mainstream characterization of al Majiri and al Majirancy? Do, do you consider this to be uh, a mischaracterization of the system? If yes, how? And what are the goals of the al Majiri schools? And are the goals of the schools in sync with the developmental needs of their communities? Northern Nigeria, and uh, as a whole. Please, can you repeat yourself? I couldn't hear you properly. Okay, okay. Thank you, Honorable. So the question is this, Honorable. Uh, there, mm -hmm. se there seems to be this clusterization, a qualification of the Almajorai as out of school children and as beggar. Mm -hmm. And just uh, this, I just spoke about that now. Would you consider this a mechanization of Almajiri? If yes, mm -hmm. what and how do you consider that to be a mixed characterization? And uh, a follow-up question to this is, what are the goals of al schools? Are the goals of al schools in line with the developmental needs of their communities, northern Nigeria and Nigeria as a whole? Thank you very much. Um, as a follow-up to what Dr. Hadiza said, uh, is there is actually a lot of misrepresentation about the al Majri and the al Majri system of education. As she rightly puts it, it is a classical system of education that provided at uh, then uh, the northern Nigerian government, even pre-colonial and even early colonial times, it provided the necessary manpower that was needed, you know, to run the administration of northern Nigeria. And of course, the issue now is about the welfare of the al -Majiri. The then system of government had a system of zakat, which was solely controlled by the Emirates. And uh, the Emirates, let me emphasize, they were the legislature, they were the, 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 the policy makers, 
they were also the complete monarchs. So they had absolute control on the finances. And so they fed the Malams, they fed the Almadres until, you know, the later days of the colonial, colonialism where the, the, the traditional rulers were now turned to, let me say, puppets of the colonial masters. Those that refused to dance to the colonial masters were now removed or even killed so that was the beginning of the suffering of the Almajiri and the Almajiranchi. So the, the rulers, the emirs had no money to feed them now. So the numbers had increased because these Almajiris were children learning the Quran and the Hadith in the environment and those that came from other places. Parents had it that in Islam, seeking for knowledge is a duty bound on every Muslim, male or female, child or adult, you know, so they took it upon themselves to take their children to any revered malam so that that malam will, you know, will bring up this child in the Islamic way. And bringing up that child in the Islamic way, meaning the child is going to be a functional member of the society. As you can see in those days, the Almadres were not fully dependent on even the society. They also gave the society what the society wanted. They produced the farmers that produced the granite pyramids, the cotton that we needed. They also produced the tanners in Kano. They also produced the businessmen in Kano, the Alhassan and Tatas, you know, the, the of, of who the descendant of is not Ngote, you know, and they produced the Isaac Arabius. They produced the miners in Jos, who were then under the Bauchi Emirate. So it was a full-fledged system that was serving the purpose. So it is a misrepresentation to think that the Almadri system is, 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 is a bad system that is now producing the street child who is not an Almadri or who may not be an Almadri that has now become a burden to the society. So the schools now that we have as Almadri schools are of different types. We have those that are run by their sheikhs and malams that do not even beg. We have so many examples. We have almost 200 schools run by Sheikh Nair Bauti. They do not beg. We have two in my constituency, Dukunafada, in Nafada in particular. They, do, they have over 300 children and they do not beg. So we are mixing up the system because we have been mis misinformed and there is a misrepresentation, Dr. Zelil. So to Thank Honorable Kakale, very rich response. Uh, Honorable Kakale, I, I, it sounds like we're, we're missing the, the full picture of the Amadri system and the Amadri school and the, the role that they play. And one of the, the comments that we, we received in line with uh, what the Honorable has just mentioned um, was that, um, and we got this from a lot of people on the pre-conversation uh, survey, that the proper education and upbringing should include in some level the study of the is Islam and Islamic sciences more broadly, right? And I've just put up one of those comments here, but this was a, a broader comment from many of the comments that were given. So uh, to you, Honorable Kakale, uh, how important is the, the infusion of Islamic teachings, Islamic principles in education? Um, and, and what does that look like in the al Madri system? And, and what are perhaps some of the, the benefits, as you see it, of, of that infusion? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Peter. As the preceding speaker said, you know, al Madri system is misunderstood. Uh, it's a system that's been there for almost uh, since the entry. And in the late uh, 19th century, they disrupt the whole system of administration, teaching, and learning. So all through this years, al Madri system is a system that produced, you know, our, our administrators, our judges, our entrepreneurs, poets. They are all they are. The legacy of, of our nation and this was a preceded colonialism. So, because when the colonials came, they, they took, completely cut out the system, you know, and to introduce the conventional or, or secular education, uh, and, and, it, and, and it went down ever since. We have to really also deconstruct, you know, the, 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 the name or the, the number of people or children who are lumped up at the margin. The core almajris that I know um, and in most of the parts where I come from is Sokoto State and 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 the North are in typical, you know, identified schools run by a sheikh. 
you can call the name of the Sheikh Ebori knows him, and the children are also identified with that school. And there are a lot of those schools that do not beg. But now, with the society and the, I mean, uh, uh, urbanization and the issue of uh, population explosion, there are other components that need the bandwagon to be called and margin. They include street children, they include some migrant children, they also include the children, you know, by, 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 by some adults and, and brought to the cities. And some children are so irresponsible parents just close to bed. Now, the classifying and known as the typical classical al students that are tied to a particular school. So it's very important that we understand this, that they are, the system of al that has been deprived of funding and care all over this has still remained there. And, and, and parents who have trusted it in, 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 in teaching the, 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 the students the Quran, uh, Islamic science, and other studies, you know, it's, it's still there. And there are a lot of chunk of them back, but it's still, still are too big. But then they are not good school at all. Uh, they are part of the, the fallout of, 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 of mismanaged urbanization and population explosion that I've given you the examples of those who are migrants, those who are street children, and those from irresponsible parents. Now, and we really have to di differentiate between al and begging. The vast majority of northern Nigeria agrees that the begging should be banned. But the Almajri system that uh, produced grand caddies for us, top administrators, entrepreneurs, exactly. and poets, and authors, calligraphers, should remain. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are saying, that that system should reform and introduce vocational, technical entrepreneurship, agriculture, and computer education. Even our own current secular system of education, let's reform. It's a system that's riddled with exam practices, uh, certificate, fake results. It's not been it's not been producing the graduates that we, we need. The, let me tell you, the secular system or the conventional system of education that are currently only produce, you know, job seekers, you know, mm -hmm. people who carry who who, who, who brandish certificates with no skills. But the Almagri system produces job creators. Uh, self-employed and, 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 and uh, people with employable skills in the in the economy, the reform sector of the Nigerian economy. So we should reform and improve it. I, I want to go to that point. That's a really important point of of the entrepreneurial spirit of many of the Almadris. And we actually uh, have a, a quick um, voice note I want to share from uh, Malam Mustafa. Uh, who has sh has kindly shared a little bit about his experience as uh, uh, from uh, growing up in the Amalgamated system? So let me uh, play that through right now. Nigeria <laughs> I continue with my elementary school. I met with Hajia Amina Kiri Ahmad. She's the one advised me to get Western education. I I started from primary four. When I finished primary four, I go to secondary school. When I finish secondary school, I go to Niger State for Technics and Geru. I read electrical and electronics. Now I'm engineer in electrical and electronics. I, I have family, I have house, I have many things. I'm not so I'm no regretted being an Almajri. I thank God. Thank you very much. And one one second part to that note and then I wanna get your reaction. Bismillah Rahman Rahim once again is Mustafa Hamisu by name. After I finish my diploma in Nigeria State Polytechnic Zangiru, where I read electrical and electronics, I decided to work in Fawa Holding Company of Nigeria and I wrote an application there, but unfortunately, I did not have my appointment there. And now change mine to be a self-employee. 
and I apply my license and Alhamdulillah I have the license I'm mean, a safe employee I have six, children, six boys learning work from me I have one wife five children Alhamdulillah I am proud of it my advice my advice to government about al majri system is that please government can can help al majri even with their food if government can give al majri food you will not see al majri begging in the street or houses i pray to almighty allah to help our government with wisdom about al majri system and so we can see there that entrepreneurial uh, uh, life story there shared. Uh, um, so I'm curious your reactions to that story. And I think that's very much in line with what you've just mentioned, Honorable Kakale, of, of those diverse experiences, the job creation experiences. So, um, you know, whoever would like to chime in on that, feel free. Uh, perhaps Hadisa, you want to chime in? Yeah, there, go ahead. I need to chime in because Mustafa is actually one of my research participants. Oh, wonderful. So when I talk about, when I talk about, and I, I like to bring their stories, these are not my stories. I say I am only a microphone, an amplifier. These people have a voice and we need to start listening to them. These people have worked with the very little that the Nigerian government has given them and has turned it into something really fantastic. Mustafa is not even a single case. We all know so many Mustafas. And yes, Mustafa, I knew from so many years ago and has just gone on to do so well when he did his primary and secondary, he managed to do it within a condensed curriculum. When he talks about being an electrician, that's not the only thing that he's doing. He's also still teaching children the Quran. He's still farming. He has so many other things that he does. And I, I think it's important that we engage with the knowledge from within, what I call RER respect engage and then reform if you listen to more people like mustafa and their sheikhs who really know what needs to be done i think we can begin to move the system along so i'm very honored to know many people like mustafa uh, honorable shatu you also wanted to chime in uh, feel free to, to share yeah. your reaction thank you very much uh the best tylers in nigeria let me tell you they are from our neighboring countries tylers the best painters are from our neighboring countries. These are skills that we can, you know, teach these young boys, you know, and then they become useful to the development of the Nigerian economy. And as Hadiza rightly mentioned, all decisions are taken without these people that are the, you know, at the center of it all, the epicenter. The almajris are not put into consideration. Their alaramas are not put into consideration. Their sheikhs are not put into consideration. Nobody talks about, you know, hearing from them. Every decision is just taken because everybody now becomes an expert when it comes to the issue of almajri. And that will never bring up a solution to this issue. We are not saying that the system is not challenged. Of course, everybody knows and we accept that there are a lot of challenges, but not bringing the, you know, those involved, you know, those that are at the epicenter will not bring us any solution to the, the issue of Almajri. Now, the, the, the technical and vocational education and entrepreneurship is the best option for these millions of children to, you know, to, to be part of the development of the Nigerian economy. Because, why did I say so? The basic education system that we want to, the, the, the governor say they, they, they should go back to their parents and be taken back to the basic education system, it cannot accommodate them. Let mm -hmm. us say the fact, the system as it is now is of already overwhelmed. We have over 160 children in a classroom. Where are we going to put about 30 million children in such schools, mm -hmm. for God's sake? It is not feasible, it is not practicable. So let us, in first and foremost, accept the realities on ground. We must think about technical, vocational, and entrepreneurial studies, as Dr. Kakele has said, and we must bring in the key players to proffer solutions to it. Let it be thrown to them and let us hear their voice. And if we are practicing democracy, we are politicians. Democracy is government of the people, for the people, by the people. These people are over these 30 million we are talking about. And they have contributed because the elder Almajris, the Alaramas, have their voters' cards. They have voted for this government. And so they must be allowed 
to pa take part in the government. And taking part in the government means, you know, talking about their future and what concerns them and how they want the government, you know, to act when it comes to their own issues. Yeah, what strikes me okay. that in what you mentioned was, that before Ghana gets his question, what strikes me what you mentioned is this, this uh, belief that somehow the formal education system can absorb uh, and, and teach in the ways that we would expect it to teach. But as I showed at the very beginning in the introduction, there are a lot of concerns about Nigerians have about the edu formal education system uh, or the so-called formal exactly. education system. So uh, I think exactly. that's a really important, a very important point. Ghana, you had, you had a question. Feel free to. Yeah, so, so our next question is to Dr. Anna. You've done a lot of work uh, with the al -Majiri. And uh, you've been running a lot of documentary with them, and uh, and uh, you seems to have this uh, very strong uh, relationship with the Almajiri community, the uh, Almajiranshi community in, in Nigeria. And uh, a lot has been said about uh, the men and women that they later become in future. But there is also this characterization out there in the mainstream media about the men and women that they become, and the school particularly has been characterized as a conduit. For the recruitment of insurgent. From your research, the scholarly activities, do you think this is the case? And uh, do you think that the kids that you work with are actually learning any special skills that set apart, that put them on the path of being distinguished members of the society? Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you so much to um, my colleagues for their really insightful talks. Um, I really enjoyed listening to them and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, oh. Sorry, there's some funny noise. Yes. Um, people are very quick to declare the al Almaty responsible for any kind of social problem that occurs. And I think that is not a new occurrence. That, um, has been the case basically since the Metatina riots in the 80s, where people were very quick to to, to conclude that it must be the al that are responsible. And we can see a continuation for that um, with Boko Haram especially, um, and now also with, with COVID-19, where people were very quick to say it's the al that are the vectors of disease that spread it. Um, and often these allegations have are based on you know little to little to no evidence. Um, so people are very quick to jump to conclusion. And I think there's one empirical question about the basis of this, these accusations. But then there's another question about why are people so quick to jump to the conclusion that it must be the al when empirical evidence isn't readily available yet. And I think that is an important question to explore. And what I found in my research is that um, the al have very, you know, low social status in their community. So it's very convenient to blame them and to just to, to lay um, blame for any kind of social problem at the doorsteps of the Makara Allo. Um, and something that also came out strongly um, from my research is that this low social standing um, perpetuates itself and that it's a real issue for, for the young people in this, in this system because um, people's attitudes translate into behavior and people treat al Majere with very little respect. And that's something that we try to get across um, through the documentary. So it's a participatory um, project um, where al Majire from three different Quranic schools um, came together um, to contribute stories they wanted to share with the wider public about their lives as al Majire. Um, and a strong message from the film is that society should treat the al Majire as human beings uh, that deserve respect and support. So building on that, you've mentioned the documentary. We actually have a clip from your documentary, and I, I want to share that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, do you want to set it up after, or do you want to react to it uh, after we play it? Set it up before. Sorry. Um, yes, please, please show it. I think it talks all right. for itself. So, we'll, we'll, all right. Sounds good. Let's let's play that. <laughs> I mean, I was a couple of women over there. I love a change. I mean, red and hanky in a hair parewa. You have a cover. Oh, yeah, I was out to call again. A walk over. I look at your mother and 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 I look at your m
Waka Timakaranta. Waka. Aminu. Aminu. Amin ya zuwa ya kai ya kauri fata ka fara canja kala cikin karakoshi da zaka kalli don an ce maka kaje ka yi min abuka ce mun wai malayi kake ji tsoro makaranta ko lokacin karatu ya riga yi bakin ciki dai kake yi kaga ya na sun shirya sun tafi makaranta a jiya wa haka ba ni a jiya su da gatan su kai kuwa iyayenka sun gaza da kai ne sun dauko ka sun kaka sai kun yi irin wannan wahalar tuku na sannan za ku samu abin da za ku da iyayenka sun so ka huta da suka tashi kawo ka bin yasa doka da akuru kura ta kayan abinci ni kwa ya na gaba na suke yin gata ne ya ba haka ba ne ya kuri dan Allah ya aminu na ce ka je falo ka dauki kudi ka je ka siyo min ka tase da tumatur da atarhu da tunda ka jibgo albasa ni dai na ga maka wannan idan kun da yaji ciki ya tsira hajiya ba haka ba ne hajiya So Hannah, for those of, uh, yeah. who are joining us from countries outside of Nigeria and, and outside of northern Nigeria, do you want to kind of give us the, a bit of the context uh, for, for, the, for the discussion, the vigorous discussion taking place in that, in that clip? Yeah, yeah, first of all, I hope we'll have a chance to hear from some of the um, al Majire or now, by now former al Majire that participated in the production of this, um, of this movie. Because I think it's, as, as, um, as my colleagues have been saying, it's really important to, list, to give them space to for themselves because they're very well capable of that and uh, we shouldn't be denying them that right um, to tell their own story. Um, I think the clip shows a couple of things. First of all, it shows how this idea that Al-Majiraya are out of school children that aren't receiving any education then means that there's very little respect for the education they are actually receiving with their employers not necessarily respecting the timetable of their schools and, um, and not giving the opportunity to, to acquire that, that learning that they are striving for. Um, but then it also shows the kind of um, exploitation maybe that is ongoing from better off segments in society, especially urban, uh, urban uh, members of society that um, find it quite convenient to employ al Majire as household helps, often paying them wages only in food or, or very, low, you know, very small sums of money uh, for their services, um, which they wouldn't burden their own children with. So it, 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 it's a hugely unequal system that yeah, takes advantage basically of these children. I think. Um, a lot of the discussion about al Majire focuses on their presumably irresponsible parents or their teachers, but I think the focus should also be more broadly on, on wider society, especially better off members of society. What is their relationship to the system? How do they benefit from its existence? And how do they maybe not take responsibility for these children in a way that they should, for example, by paying decent wages? Absolutely. Gana, over yeah. to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Honorable Kakali, a lot has been said about uh, how uh, received uh, al Majiri, al Majirai uh, in their various community. Uh, they've been considered to be treated with little to no respect. And uh, it seems that the conversation about uh, al, -Majiri, al Majiranshi in Nigeria seems to be overlooking this critical aspect of conversation. From your own experience as a member of the National Assembly and as a distinguished citizen native of northern nigeria what do you think we need to do differently to change how the almajirai are receiving the community and how they are treated in the in in the larger nigerian society what do you think we need to change in our attitude and that we need to bring this to the conversation about almajiri school and almajiranshi thank you very much Janlili. what we need to do is for the government to recognize the Almadri as a system of has been there for centuries, a system that have produced our grand caddies, our entrepreneurs, our administrators, leaders, agriculturists, and and, and, and shell molders uh, and behavioral molders over there and philosophers. Uh, once we do not recognize the system of education, then that system will continue to suffer neglect and the disrespect. Someone go through a school and he is able to write Arabic, speak Arabic, memorize the entire Quran, even write other texts and go to higher education and still be regarded as out of school. We do not consider Al Majire as out of school children. It's a misnomer, actually. They're in a different school that have been refused to be recognized by the government. And even at that, in our research, we realize that since 2004 have made a provision for funding of Almajiri on the UBEC system. It's in the UBEC Act. 
2004, this is 16 years on, section 151 described universal basic to include special groups, Valmajuri, Nomads, and others. But all our state governments, or most of them, have always not been able to fund them, them only funding the, the convention. Hello? We're, we're, it looks like we're having a little bit of a connection difficulties there. Uh, well, so we, oh, there we go. So, yeah, and, and build a content and support to legislate and strengthen the legislation concerning education. We use system, for example, there's the Montessori system, and I think the Catholic system. It's been around the world, and, and, and it worked for, 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 for a lot of communities where they practiced. So it's a system that has like, it should be recognized, and, and, and the curriculum should be adopted to the needs of the, of, of the people, so that the, the main focus is, of course, primary education, of some literacy in English and Hausa um, arithmetic, and then a load and load of vocational, technical, entrepreneurship, agricultural and computer education. That's the, what we call V-type in, in, in our model. With that, they will be self-employed and they're educated literate. But we will we, we do demand the states to implement the UPEC at, at its contained its law. But they have neglected that that, that, that aspect. So 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 we will strengthen the legislature uh, in various of course, as I've said, the UBEC Act is there, the the, the, the violence against and then the Charles Act. Those are uh, in his term, his right to pass human dignity, his right to 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 to, to stay in a good environment and and, and be treated as 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 a citizen of Nigeria. Yeah, the, yeah, we had a thank you for your response. Obviously, we have a little bit of connection issues now and again. I mean, that's the that's the nature of doing. Uh, uh, a, a event that has all different countries joining from all the different places. And, and we've all seen that uh, on our TVs when people are trying to do this in, in this uh, COVID-19 era. So thank you, Honorable, for your comments. I want to I want to get uh, some comments from um, Sadiso Salisu. Um, uh, Hannah, you've mentioned uh, the, the importance of hearing voices and, and those who have sort of contributed to the research and, and had those experiences. We've actually have him calling in today, and so I'm going to put him on. Hopefully, everything works out on his end, uh, Sidisu. So let me uh, put him on, so hopefully you, everyone can see him. Hello, can you hear us, Sidisu? Uh, hey, I Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm very fine. One Wonderful. We, we've been talking a lot about sort of the entrepreneurial spirit of the Al Madri and the Al uh, Madri system and how it produces um, um, people who have an entrepreneurial spirit. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your experience, your first hand experience? Sidiso, can you hear us? Hello, Sidiso, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, good, good. Spirit. Yes, Why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your experience, your first hand experience. Yeah, on the entrepreneurial uh, journey, right? In the uh, emergency system of education, right? Yes, absolutely. Can you hear us? Hello, Sidiso, can you hear us? Thank you so much for. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I just kind of. Uh, like Good. Just talk a little bit about your your experience. Yeah, on the entrepreneur uh, journey, right? The. Uh, right? Yes, absolutely. So, 
the law of fear. Okay. We are not hearing fear. Ghana, go go ahead. Sorry, we're having a little bit of connection difficulties there that uh, hopefully we can iron out. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully it's going to call back uh, uh, before the end of the program. So next, uh, the next question goes to Honorable uh, Aisha too. And I'm aware that you actually work on this during the presidency of uh, uh, later Umaru Musa Yaradwa. There is what they call the education for all goals. And here there was a concern expressed by UNESCO uh, in 2009, uh, uh, but uh, 11 countries were identified to be overpopulated, and UNESCO specifically argued that uh, those countries uh, were not going to be able to achieve the education for all goals, uh, unfortunately and interestingly as well. Nigeria was listed among those countries. And one of the interesting points mentioned by UNESCO is that uh, they identified, they, they argued that uh, one of the common patterns with the 11 countries that they predicted would not be able to achieve the education for all goals is that they practice one form of management system or the other. Honorable Aisha, the question to you is nowadays, how do you think this type of narrative from UNESCO and other external influences feed into the decision by northern governors in Nigeria to ban al system of education. Thank you very much. Incidentally, um, I was a minister from 2007 to 2010 until the death of uh, the late President Umar Musayar Adwa. UNESCO realized that there are nine countries that could not achieve the MDGs. And so I decided to put these countries together. And these countries have been identified to have large populations of children that are going to either a madrasa at Sangaya or an Almajiri school. And so we were put together. I led the Nigerian delegation. We went around and we found that the best system was the Indonesian system of the madrasa. And this was adopted by these countries. And we came up with one model, taking best practices from all these countries. And we came back with this model. And this model was what was, was what was adopted by the Federal Executive Council. Subsequently, after the death of President Umar Musa Radua, it, it was continued under President Goodluck Jonathan, but with a uh, modification. This saw the establishment of the al schools that we now have, uh, you know, that were not accepted by mm -hmm. the Malams, of course, because there was a problem. That is all about um, uh, UNESCO. UNICEF is also doing a lot because uh, even getting the statistics and the data of the children and the schools, you know, is a big issue. And uh, um, uh, agencies like UNICEF is taking up, and I'm, I'm about they are about to complete now a data collection on the system because whatever we want to do, we have to know. You know, how many Amaji children do we actually have? How many mm -hmm. of these schools are even existing? How many are functioning? What are the sizes of these schools? And then where, what are the issues? Is it welfare? Is it uh, mm -hmm. staffing? Whatever it is, you know? So a lot has been done. But I want to emphasize that the basic education system that we have now cannot contain these children. So taking them to this system cannot be the solution. Secondly, taking them to their parents cannot also be a solution. Why? Because the parents are suffering from abject poverty. So they are just going to be taken back to the parents without food to eat. They become the same nuisance as they were in the, in, in the headquarters of the states and other big cities. So the only solution now is why don't we see to the implementation of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the UBE law? So many chapters in the Constitution has emphasized that government shall strive to, you know, proper solution to education. Government shall encourage science and technology. Government shall give basic education, secondary education, university education, as I went to. Then the UBE law, the UBE law has all given the, the states, you know, 2% of the federal government contrib contribution from her consolidated revenue fund to, 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 to take 
you know, as a counterpart fund, part fund, so that basic education can be implemented at the state levels. Now, we have to ask our leaders, have they assessed these funds? Right now, as we speak, we have 110 billion Naira lying in the CBN, unassessed by these states. So this part of the money is part of the money for the Almajiri. What have we done with that? We have to ask our leaders to be accountable. Now, the UBE law again says that these children are different from street children. They are different from the the the, the children that are out of school. Yeah. They are different from the girl child. They are different from special vulnerable groups. It is stated clearly there. I want to share it. I'm going to share the law now to you, and all of you should read it. So the Constitution and the UBE law are just perfect for the implementation. So if we implement the Constitution and the UBE law to the latter, and then ask our leaders to account for what we have given them, I think there will be a solution for the al And there is, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. But as long as we do not implement our laws to the latter, and as long as we do not ask our leaders to tell us what they do, and as long as we are not carried along, I mean the al the teachers, and the sheikhs are not carried along, we will never get to where we want to get to. And for the next years, the, the al child will still be roaming about, you know, uh, elsewhere, not in the school. So I'm, I want to I, share the, the sorry the, the the screen share is not going to be able to come up. So we were, unfortunately we're not going to be able to see that. So uh, that's why there's a little Skype icon there. Um, but uh, please kindly share share the the wording of that so that everyone can be aware. So there we're, we're back here. But I want to follow up on something really important that you said, and it's something that was also mentioned in the Zoom room um, from Dr. Uh, Bala. Um, which is, uh, do we have data uh, of all these schools? And, uh, and suggesting that this is sort of a first step to, to thinking about this and thinking about policy solutions if we do think it's a policy matter. Um, and so, uh, Hadisa, you know, do we have data? It sounds like we don't. Um, and if so, why don't we have data? Uh, uh, um, and, what, and if we did have data, what types of data should we be even gathering um, when we think about that? We have some form of data, but I'd like to call it a guesstimate. When I see figures that says 10 to 13 million or however million, I keep wondering, right, how did we come about that? Who counted? Because if you go to state levels, um, very few states actually know how many schools they have, how many al schools, how many malame, never mind how many boys are in the system. As part of my study, I did a manual count of schools in Mina, Niger State. And I think I stopped at about 100. I literally went vicinity because I couldn't find anything. I've seen uh, UBAC figures. I've seen um, UNICEF figures. I've seen various figures. But I, I, I really cannot swear by those data. I, I don't know. I think we have an estimate. That's the mm -hmm. best that we have. And I agree with Dr. Balam that we need to go back and revisit. Because most of the data that we have is also slightly old. I know UBEC also has some data that I have been shown. I think we need a comprehensive set of data. And this is not something that you do once. You don't collect mm. figures and then hold them for five years and think nothing has changed. But generally, we don't tend to have a record of birth in Nigeria anyway, or a record of death. So our, our data would always be slightly shaky. So in a quick answer to your question, we do have some form of data. How much, how reliable they are is another question entirely. Okay. Hannah wanted to chime in on that, that data question. Go ahead, Hannah, before Ghana, sorry. Yes, please. Um, I think it's important also to bear in mind the politics that come with collecting data about schools. And um, I just want to share an example from Kano State, where the schools that had registered with the government, so were on the government's radar, were the first schools that, to, to undergo forced um, evacuations. And these evacuations were conducted in very problematic ways, where um, HISPA and police came in the middle of the night collecting students and bringing them to camps where, especially in the beginning, food was scarce. So some of the children went away because they were struggling. And then some of them are still not being found um, because they left the camp um, in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I think 
schools become increasingly wary of sharing their data with the government if then that data is being used in very problematic ways to crack down on them and to um, to implement punitive measures. So I think um, government should be very, very careful about punitive measures um, because that will undermine trust and make, make schools and, and their teachers very reluctant to share that kind of information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That issue of trust seems very important when gathering this type of information, given um, you know, what has already transpired policy-wise. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Ghana. Your question. Yeah, so Aisha to talk about uh, this fund that is lying out there that is not being, uh, you know, appropriated by the governors in northern Nigeria to support the funding of uh, Al Majri School. So, Honorable Balara Besheu Kakali, my question to you is this You are one of the political leaders in northern Nigeria. What actually explains the apathy? on the part of Northern Nigeria governors uh, in assessing this fund and, and in budgeting for the continue, for the support of al Majri school. What, what explains this? Is it because they've characterized al Majri as out of school children, uh, children and al Majri as, uh, al -Majri as out of school children? Or is, is it because they don't even consider al Majri as a form of schooling system? What explains this apathy? We would like to know. Well, actually, it's, it's, it's uh, multifactorial, but uh, it's, I think it's part of the challenges we're having as a federal system here in, in Nigeria, where uh, sometimes laws that are enacted by the federal government are not sometimes followed through uh, in, in, in an all-inclusive manner with the state governments. There are a lot of acts at the federal level able to, to be really uh, have that degree of community participation and ownership at the state level, and they have not even been domesticated. That's probably what happened with the UBEC Act of 2004. It is here, it's two years on. 2.5% of the consultant revenue of the federal government is going to be put in a special account where the states will be given counterpart funding to access funds based on their budgets for universal basic education. But well, surprisingly, the northern states have not been applying these funds to the al system of education. And al is clearly written there. It's in this highlight that, 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 that I'm, I'm, I'm showing, uh, Section 15. If anyone gets this document of the law, you know, of, of the act, we'll see it there. So from my experience over this, the, the uh, ministers of education, our boards of universal basic primary education in the states to BIBs, they don't talk of al at all in their in, in their structure of, of, of implementing education, you know, uh, in, in their states, which means there is a fundamental understanding or ignorance about what the UBEC Act says. It's not only on formal conventional education, but the funding should also take care of special, you know, uh, education, including al -Majri. It's clearly stated there, nomads, girl child, mass literacy and vocational training. They have all related. So, so following up on that, uh, to, the, to the background. So, so, so it's been discussed this time about that. It's largely with the states. The fund to some extent have done its part. There is now currently one over 100 billion land there, not accessed by some states. So from now on, states must be made to understand they have to include al special education of skin children, vulnerable groups with people with disability, and even street children or others with special needs in their universal education system. So it's a matter of failure to apply or to understand this act I'm holding right here before me. So uh, of course, we'll continue to, to, to advocate, get stakeholders, the ulama, the al the graduates, uh, uh, the, the, the state house assembly, and importantly, just recently, the house leadership has agreed that for any law that is going to be enacted at the federal level, they will really go for a wholesale participation and inclusion of states so that we have its implementation and enforcement and follow up across the federation so that we don't have a repeat of what's happening with the Charles Act, Violence Against uh, People Act. And, and many other acts that just get in the clouds at the federal level in the states. 
I hope I can answer your question. Yeah, thank you so much, Amaru Kakai. Over to you, Peter. And, and commissioners will So, so if things are are fairly clear in law, there's a framework in place, and as you mentioned, there's even uh, money available. What should be the recourse for those to ensure that that the the law is applied, right? And so this is the thing that has been has been raised to our attention. So, honorable Aisha, to um, what 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 recourse can there be? Um, and you've pointed also to the law as well. What recourse can there be? Uh, and, and what should both uh, lawmakers as well as civil society be doing to advocate around, around this law? Thank you very much. Uh, as you have all seen that the laws are very, very clear and uh, beautiful, in fact, because I, I hate to hear an Almighty child address as a street child. But because the law has clearly stated that the street child is not an Almighty child. So, but you can see that uh, over time, this has come to mean one word. So, how do, as you have rightly asked, how do we make sure that these, these laws are implemented? It takes a lot of effort and commitment, even to, you know, as a politician. I see when, when we go around to campaign and we make promises that we do not deliver on our promises. So, it's, it's still number one, the leader commitment on the leadership because you were brought in to, to become a leader by law. I was elected because the constitution said there should be an election that brings in a representative from the Kunafada. So I must respect the law and I must make sure that it is implemented to the latter. But where the law is, is looked at and is not enforced, then there will be problem. So of the Almadri child and Almadri is, you know, the lack of implementation of the law. And so, since this is the case, we need international NGOs, national NGOs, uh, groups, and probably also a technical committee you know, that will bring in everybody, including the, the Alaramas, the Sheikhs, the, the NGOs, the legislators, to, to, to continue to, to voice it out. And the parents, of course, who are the key players, they also have a very big role to play. And so uh, we also need to do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, awareness creation because so many people do not know that even the UBEC law is supposed to fund the Almadri child. Some people do not know. Even the Malams, they don't know. The Sheikhs, they do not know. And they, they are not worried because they have already been used to taking care of their children the way they are. And that is why the, the population has become so overwhelming and cannot take care of them. And so welfare issues now come in, and that is you see the Almighty Ritual taking for food. So we need to, you know, all the efforts together in one basket, you know, so that we see to the implementation of the law first before we think of amendment, because the law is comprehensive and the federal government has already given the funds. So what do we need? It's only the commitment, you know, to, to enforce the law. That is what we need. For example, I said in the UBE law, I am, I'm also an advocate of the girl child, in the UBE law, it says that any parent that refuses to send his girl to school should be, you know, reprimanded and should be, should be, uh, should be taxed to 2,000 Naira. I know that 2,000 Naira, a parent can pay a hundred times. So when it comes to the girl child, I know that. There has to be an amendment of that law. But in the case of the Almighty, the money is there, the funds are there lying in the central CBM, and the other Ramas are there, ready to cooperate. The Sheikhs are there, ready to give us the best options to go about it. So what do we need? So we we need to you know come together and continue to pursue the issue of this child that has been left. And I see the Almighty as a formidable force as a formidable, you know, employable force that can take the Nigerian economy to the next level. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, so, yeah, uh, Dr. Adisa and uh, Dr. Anna, there has been a lot of conversation, you know, about uh, uh, the governors not assessing this fund, this very beautiful legislation <laughs> being in place and uh, not being implemented. So the question is this, from your own research experience, 
working with the Almajurai communities in different parts of Nigeria. How do you think we can embark on Fota's education so that the Almajurai and the Amalamai can bring the issue of implementation of those, uh, you know, uh, legislative framework as, a, as, an, as an electoral issues that politicians will commit to when they are seeking electoral office. So how do you think we can go about, uh, you know, educating the Almajurai school, Al school, the Almajurai, the Malamai, that uh, they need to get politicians to commit to this before they can actually give them their vote and elect them into offices? Do you want to go first, Yeah, I love you. You know, it's, it's funny. Um, in my research, I say with all the negative race representations, many Nigerians hold a simultaneously noble and degrading stereotype of the system. It's a system we love to hate, but we actually engage with. Uh, often very hypocritically, I find in Northern Nigeria, like, so what I say is, um, they're not powerless. These al these sheikhs are actually extremely powerful as well, especially when it comes to times of elections and stuff like that. So I personally think that's the time that they can leverage whatever power they have and to kind of start really advocating. So in terms of them being aware, yes, they could be more aware of what the law says. And, and I think that's the job of people like us, all of us here, to make them be aware, but also to really leverage the power that they yield, because they are not powerless. They are often, it's so common, um, the prayer economy, it's, it's recognized by Lastan Suarez. In my research, I call it acts of Malamta. They are so fundamental to know Nigerian society. Like people go to them for ministration, people go to them for gene possession. When you're not feeling well, it's accepted wisdom. Even I would take a paracetamol and pray three people who allow if I have a headache. If someone wants to pray for me, I'll accept it. And so you find children also being um, commissioned to complete the Quran for special things. So these are the powers that they can yield and i think is recognizing that they hold that power and really using them towards their own good so maybe educating them as to what is contained in this law and really helping to reveal the power that they already hold especially i say with politicians with all due respect to the honorables especially times of politics in times when there is an election that's the time that the man can wield their powers mm -hmm. anna you also want to chime anna. in on this yeah, um, I think there's a bit of a loss of confidence in that the democratic system delivers what it what it promises. And um, I heard a lot of frustration from Kano that people say at election time, the politicians come and say, I am a Ladama as well, and um, I'm going to, you know, fight for your interest if I'm elected. And then um, once they're in office, they forget about their constituencies and all their promises and, and try to shut the al system down. So I think that has lost, lo led to a huge loss of trust in, in what politicians promise and what they actually deliver. Um, I think one way of building that trust back up again is to stay away from punitive measures, to stay away from measures that mm -hmm seek to close down schools, that seek to pen punish parents um, for not involving their children in modern education. I think what needs to change is maybe the perception of, of, of this part of the population. They make informed decisions uh, about what to do with their children, and these de decisions are informed by the state of the education system as it is. And if that's not very attractive, if that means the children will be going to play langa, um, in, in the school yet because the teacher maybe hasn't shown up, shown up because he hasn't been paid. You know, that, that really discourages parents from involving their children in the system. And I think we should understand that these parents also make, you know, responsible decisions on the basis of the situation they encounter. Um, so I think any kind of punitive measures are really, are really problematic because they treat rural parents as ignorant and, and, you know, as lacking concern for their children. And I think that's not the case. That's quite a, um, a problematic attitude. And the same is true for the Malame. I think many of them are actually um, not so opposed to, to reform if they have trust that this reform is actually um, in, in the interest of the, them and their students and that it's not another way of disenfranchising them. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. So, so building on this, this issue um, of talking about power in the context of elections, 
I, I, I'm curious, uh, th this question, and it, and it comes to mind given the current political um, configuration in Nigeria. And as you know, some, uh, some of our viewers may not know, um, All Progressives Party, or also known as APC, is, is the ruling party at the presidential level, as well as in many of the northern governorships and, and plays a dominant role in, in politics in northern Nigeria. We also have, obviously, our, our two honorables here are members of the APC party themselves. And it seems, and it, and it strikes me that there's a lot of difference of opinion in the context of the APC itself, um, because we see a lot of northern governors of the same party holding a very different view uh, towards the al Madri system. So I'm curious, um, why is there such a big difference within the, the party itself? And do you see any hope or any uh, ability to provide some sort of consensus at the party level as, as a group of, of, of like-minded politicians on this issue of, of, of the Amalgari system? So I'll, I'll start with you, Honorable Aishatu, and then uh, Honorable Kabale, I'll, I'll, I'll like to, Kakale, I'll like to get your word on that. Before Honorable Aisha speaks, I'm of the PDP. I'm not oh, a PC. Sorry, sorry, PDP. I'm, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm I meant to... People's Democratic Party. <laughs> yes. I meant to say, I, I meant to say uh, PDP yeah. there, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Honorable Thank you. Aishatu. You know, things could always be opposition. He doesn't want to belong to us. Well, we are the ruling party, Honorable Kakele. So sorry, so you have to be there. Wait for me to speak first. <laughs> <laughs> let me say that. <laughs> let me, lest we forget, let me say that it is not only the Almadri that has been abandoned. Even the teachers have been abandoned, and they are in their thousands. So let us put that at the back of our mind. Now, coming to what you said, uh, Peter. Yes, there are divergent views, even in the governor's forum. You have, you have seen it. Because it's a belief. And it is a belief system that Honorable Kakele has earlier mentioned that has produced. And in fact, it is still producing our imams. 80% of the imams in our mosque are product of the al system. Then 90% of those Quranic teachers in our houses, let me just mention Abuja alone, 90% of those that teach our children in Abuja are product of the, this al system. Now, that is why it, there will be divergent views, because many people believe that this is a system that has produced so much for Islam, and it cannot just be allowed to be banned or to whatever they would they would they, they would call it you know so it is because it is a belief and because so many people see it as a functional system of education that is tied to islam so it cannot be banned that is why you see different views and the only thing that can be done is to look at the constitution the ube the education basic education or education generally is on the concurrent list, and the responsibility of basic education lies with the states. Federal government, as I said earlier, only gives her contribution, and it gives that contribution in the form of 2% of her consolidated revenue fund. So it is the duty of the state governors to do whatever they like, but to make sure that they provide that basic education, which includes al education, as stated clearly in the UBE law. How they do it is their problem, but the guiding law is the UBE law. So that is why you have different views, even by the governors. Some are saying they have not banned it, some are saying they are remodeling, some have said they have already banned it. And some do not see it as it is today as a security threat. They only see it as a welfare problem, and they are ready and willing to look at the welfare issue of the Almighty child in view of its productiveness. So, w wonderful. And coming to you, Honorable Kakale, um, from, from the perspective of, of the opposition, and I know Ghana is going to kind of build on this, uh, thinking about reflecting on uh, the, the period of time when good luck Jonathan was in power. But uh, uh, what does it look like in terms of, of, of this issue in the context of the opposition? Is there a lot of in agreement within your caucus? Is there a lot of difference of, of, of opinion. What does it look like uh, in your caucus?
Looks like I think we've lost him again. For, I think. Oh, mm -hmm. there we go. <laughs> there are like three groups of uh, of people. I mean, of of school of thought about Amaju. There are the reformists, uh, mm -hmm. the evolutionists, and and and, and there are the conservatives. Uh, those who really want. Well, so we are part of the we were on the side of the reform. It's, it's across party lines, both the APC and the PDP. And uh, it will interest you to know the reps on the leadership of Mr. Speaker, Afimi Bajam Miela, dedicated a day discussion. Okay, dedicated a day for the discussion on, on al Majri in the National League. And, and, and my, the governor of my state, Right Honorable Aminu Waziri Tambwa, have also committed a lot in reforming al Majri system uh, 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 in support of state. Where you know uh, there have been a lot of efforts to 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 learn from systems and models in in Far East, Indonesia, Malaysia, as well as uh, in, in the Gulf countries. And currently, uh, uh, the the government with the uh, Zakar Work a Free Commission uh, by Manlo Medoki uh, is 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 building up a reform of 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 the Almaty system on the Indonesian system of Pondo. Uh So uh, I'll, I'll tell you the issue about Almaty reform is. A bipartisan thing. I, uh, members from across party lines uh, all support reform uh, of the al system so that to, to, to build human capacity is about human capacity development. 10 million children. Uh, uh, if you skill them up, it doesn't almost skill, Nigeria will be, will, be, will be a great, great, great country and will definitely be where we want it uh, in terms of uh, security of lives, property, and prosperity. So it's a bipartisan thing. Uh, right. Both sides we support reform, and there are some who are conservative. Very interesting. And I think that's a really an important thing to reflect on, given our discussion about the importance of elections and in, in the process of advocacy. That there are these, you know, cross pressures within the the political elite on this issue. So I'm glad you raised yeah, that. Yes, on the issue of election, the politicians usually yeah they use the Almaty system. Uh, in 2015 elections, you know, there, there are a lot of discussions about the need to reform al -Majri, and al is massively, you know, uh, supported uh, the, 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 the incoming APC government then. Uh, and, and even, and even in, in, in the second election of, of, uh, of 2019. But, but to tell the truth, a lot of people are disappointed. Uh, uh, the, the, the government party has not been able to do well uh, for and, and keep the promises on the form of al -Majri. Yeah. But that issue of that issue of uh, keeping promises seems to be one that we one has to reflect on uh, promises at election time and and Hadiza, you also mentioned that issue of of, of promises as well, um, not always kept. Uh, Honorable Aishatu, I saw your hand was up there for for a moment. Did you, yeah. did you have a response? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to share an information that in my conversation with a lot of the sheikhs, the, of course, as Kakale said, they have lost confidence in us, the politicians and the leaders. They, they, they always emphasize on uh, one of the pillars of Islam, which is zakat, that is a pain of mm -hmm. arms. And they feel that uh, where the communities are largely Muslims, the law, you know, enforcing zakat should be promulgated by the state assemblies and then the money and the funds from the card should be used you know for the almajiri uh, almajiri schools and uh, i share their concern in this because um of course nigeria is a secular state but of course we have also states that are mostly populated by muslims and of course since they believe in in that i feel you know considering their own point of view is also very very important and i also want to add that you started with the speech of Mr. President, President Muhammad Buhari, when he was inaugurating the National Economic Council, and he, he showed his, uh, his concern about this group of people, you know, these children, the al -Majri. So, Honorable Kakale, even the APC-led administration is doing a lot to see, because if, if, if it were not for his concern, he wouldn't have brought this as a major economic issue during the inauguration of the National Economic Council. So the APC government is, is doing its best, and the federal government has never relented in paying the 
of the consolidate uh, of the funds for these states to assess but what do we see we have states that have not assessed their funds since 2018 the the money is lying fallow in the cbf so the federal government has done its part okay yeah so there's been a lot of conversation about uh, what government is able to do and what the government is not able to do and uh, one signature project of this current administration uh, at the level of the, the presidency is the school feeding program. A number of states have keyed in into the school feeding program. And one of the major issues that have been used to characterize the Almagiri schooling system is this issue of begging. And it's been one of the major issues that the Northern government that have banned the system emphasized as one of the reasons why the system needs to go. They particularly ban al Majoranshi by equating it with begging. And they also ban the school as well. They ban two things simultaneously. So the question to you is this, Honorable Aisha to and Honorable Balara Bushiru Kakali, why is it that the Northern government, they have not extended the school feeding programs being implemented by the federal government and by them to the Almagiri schools. Honorable Aishatu, do you want to start off start off on that question? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I want to say thank you very much, Dr. Jalili. We have asked, we have invited the Minister for Humanitarian Affairs, and we have asked her several of these questions. Even the students now that they are at home because of COVID-19. The money is sent to their parents, even at home. But the Almagri child, there is not even a desk, a desk officer, you know, in any of the suburbs that is state universal basic education boards in the states, not even a desk officer. So I quite agree with you that in this aspect, there are questions that need, that are begging for answers. And uh, I think we shall get to the root of the matter. Honorable Kakali. About. Can you, can you, yeah, we can hear. We can hear you. Yeah. That, that's the nation we have been talking about. The system, the state has refused to recognize the Almagri system. And that's why at initial, they, ref, they failed to include them in the school feeding program. Honestly, it's it's really, really, really a tragedy. You know, the people. The, one of the things that really had made al system an outcast is because of the destitution, the hunger, and the begging. And there's an opportunity to feed these children in the schools, uh, but it, it it was missed. So so as as on the the minister of you try to the direction the army system the army system should be part of the schooling but it's because it's not being recovered law so we will we will continue to demand that it's more organized manners of, uh, of the country, including the school program. So that's what we want to call. Adisa, what is your take on this? I, you know, it's funny. I was just, as you were speaking, I was thinking back to my research. And one of the things that I noticed was oh God, how all the men I interviewed and everything, they never say Zamuje Bara. Bara is the word for begging. They don't say Munyi Bara. They say Munje Neman Abinchi. We go looking for food, which shows it's a very it's different. They are not begging because they want to beg. They are going in search of sustenance. And one of the other things that I noticed was the the children that you see looking for food on the streets are very young. No Almajiri worth his salt by the time he hits puberty still begs. 
Yeah. They would go and work in houses like Hannah's documentary shows. They would do other things. They are very, very entrepreneurial, very hardworking. So what that says to me is, in terms of reform, if we can find a way to make sure that they're fed. One of my initiatives is just an adopt an imaginary school initiative. And what we do is just to make sure my agreement with the Malame is often our help with feeding, but your children cannot be on the streets begging. And then you help them with farming and finding other ways for sustainable living. So a fish pond, for instance, a little farm. And then you give them whatever you can. More people can do this. If all we can do, if an individual can take 20 children off the streets, 30 by feeding them, that would help. And this is where community responsibility comes in in Islam. First, you fire. What are your community obligations? You cannot feed your children where the children outside are hungry. It was never like that. In all our households growing up, we had children coming in to feed from the pot. What has happened to northern Nigeria? When did we start blaming people for policy failures? When did we start blaming the poor for being poor? When did we start maligning the poor for the choices that they've had to make because government hasn't done it? So for me, it's going back to what our roots are, what our values are. And just as Nigerian elite, which we all are, just being slightly more compassionate and looking at ourselves in the mirror. What have we done? What is our responsibility in the state of things as they stand? Till we can really ask ourselves that. And that's why the northern governors, for the first time being so um, proactive, it appears, in repatriating and banning. I was like, wow, you mean you can act that fast? Why haven't you done that before in reform? Why is it only in a time of COVID and needing to, 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 to share your children out as if you're sharing groundnut, like you're doing tell and get ah, who wants some? These are human lives. These are children. We need to treat them with more compassion. And, and building on that point uh, about community involvement, um, and obviously this isn't necessarily community involvement because civil society is not necessarily in, rooted in all communities that it works, yeah. obviously. Um, and there are a lot of different actors within civil society. But what is, what is the role that civil society organizations are now playing on the ground? Are they um, getting involved in some of the, the issues of, of food and, and these issues? Are they getting involved in terms of, of schooling? Where is civil society, or are they not really in the picture? What, what do you see, Hadiza, in, in, in way of civil society organizations that have, have grown up in northern Nigeria? There has been an explosion of people concerned about There's so many people, and be, being in this field, because um, the temperature is very high, people get incensed. Like some of us doing the work we do get accused of all kinds of romanticizing the system of trying to make excuses. And I've been asked, where are your own children? Like it really gets personal. I just keep reminding myself that everyone who talks, who engages in the system, they do that because they care that we're all on a spectrum. Some might be for reform, some might be for a ban, but I'd like to think that it's because we care. So back to that, there are so many organizations involved from a child's right perspective or no, from a security perspective, from an educational perspective, from a social perspective, I have definitely seen an influx of people being interested in Almagerenchi. Now, my fear, my deep fear as a Nigerian and as a scholar is that we're still doing this in 10 years. I'd hate to be on a panel like this in 10 years. I really don't want that. So I think for those of us who are involved in this field, we need to ask ourselves the honest to God question. It's about intentions. Why are you doing what you're doing? Are we all working towards addressing the system? Or are we doing it because it's the new buzzword? That is what we need to keep reminding ourselves about. Hannah, on that, so, Hannah, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, Ghana. Yeah, so Hannah was going to ask you this question. You know, there's been a lot of talk about, uh, you know, what we need to do right and uh, what the politician needs to do. So during your research, uh, did you have any conversation with the al Majirai al regarding what they feel should be done, you know, to have reposition the system in a way that it would be able to overcome some of its, uh, many of its challenges? Yeah, I wish we, we could hear from some of the insiders themselves. <laughs> um, but yeah, I understand that the connection is, is a challenge. Um, what I encountered was quite a willingness to 
combine Quranic study with um, Islamia study and Boko study, so to acquire as much knowledge as possible, basically. And I think um, there is willingness even from Malame to integrate that into their school, to so allow their students um, at moments where there is no clash with their Quranic lessons to attend um, modern forms of education or to do that on Thursday and Friday, which are the weekend days of the Quranic schools. There's a lot of willingness to accept um, support in terms of infrastructure. Um, I, I don't think any schools would refuse if they if they um, think that the intentions are honest. I think there's a lot of fear by now, as I've, I've, as I've said before, that, um, that the government isn't necessarily sympathetic and, and, and that any kind of interventions might in the end turn, um, be turned against them. Um, but in itself, seeking knowledge, especially the younger generation, I think the al are very keen to seek different forms of knowledge, not only Quranic knowledge, but also vocational training, Boko, um, Western is not the right name, but secular knowledge, if you want. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're getting a oh, lot one, of... One thing I was, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Just um, one thing I wanted to add is that many of the, of the Malame I encountered, especially in urban areas, they are sending their own children and they're teaching them the Quran, but they also sent them to... Um, um, to the Makaranta Boko, they also sent them to um, a secular school. So the, the Malame themselves are open to this idea, and they are um, maybe not all of them, but an important contingent that the government should be um, reaching out to. So I think times are changing. I think there's a lot of reform willingness within the system as long as people inside the system feel they can trust the intentions of the politicians that handle the reform. Go ahead, Hadiza. I saw your hand there. It's one of the things I, I've noticed in my research as well. I call it change from within. It's amazing that all the men I researched, um, none of them, well, except one, I said they would send their children to an Almaji school like they attended. Yeah. But they are very happy to send their children to the modern Islamia, which is again on the spectrum of Islamic education. But I think that's because them being in the cities, them being in the urban areas now, puts them in a different demographics to their parents. These Islamias are not free. We, as much as we tout basic, universal basic education as being free, it's not free. It comes at an opportunity cost. You have to buy uniforms, you have to buy textbooks, there's time cost. And these are the things that people don't factor in. So if you say, well, there are Islamias, why not send your child there? They're not free. These former al Majre can send their children there because now they have alternative sources of income. In rural areas, these Islamias don't exist like, it, like they do. The few Western-style schools that exist are not fit for purpose. So these really, it brings us back to the question of our educational landscape, of what's available to the poor man. Even middle class and elite Nigerians don't send their children to public schools. We've, we've run away from those. We send them to private schools. We send them abroad because we know that they don't offer much. So why are we expecting these people to, to, to come to the places that we don't want to come to? I feel for me, as a Nigerian elite, and I put my hand up, <laughs> we need to ask a difficult question of our community, the state of affairs in Nigeria. Like, I cannot even begin to blame the poor till I've completely blamed us for the state of Nigeria. And if we're going to borrow from the dominant discourses that call these people are failures, perhaps we can then begin to blame the schooling that produced us as being responsible for the state of Nigeria today. I, 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 really, okay, like that, I, I really like that reflection, and you bring up this, this distinction of, of the elites, and then, uh, as Hannah was saying, the, the, the voices of those who have experience. We've been talking about this, the, this difference of opinion. And uh, not, not to say that the people who are, you know, we're, 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 we're seeing a lot of people who are joining our session today with very different views. Um, and so I want to summarize that and begin to get your reactions to that. Because perhaps this uh, is a result of very diff big differences within the elites, but also amongst the broader audience of the populace as well. And I'll come to you, uh, uh, Honorable Kakale. Go ahead. You know? Yes. Can you? you yes, know something I, to say? I, yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to respond to, to a very good uh, uh, statement made by, by by uh, Dr. Hadija, Professor Hadija, that uh, what exactly a lot of us are in this for. Uh, it's really, really a, a very, very uh, a good question because. For me, 
what we see al Majore as honestly massive human capital resource poverty killed up over 10 minutes 10 million that's more than the population is being as children being thought you know the education of of, of of the Quran and Islamic studies and science and 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 a bit of the literacy maybe in English house and arrangement and then they are all you know, uh, like engage into agriculture. Imagine the, uh, what Nigeria would be. We'll be able to feed ourselves. And the Almighty system, I really want to, us to, to understand that it's a system that produces people who solve problems, who can take care of themselves, who are self employed. As again, the current secular conventional education system that produces uh, certificate bearers who are, look, who are job seekers and right. who have a syndrome of SOP. We have a problem as well that solve our problem for us. That is what the Nigerian education has produced for uh, in, in the country. We have produced graduates that think that somebody somewhere should be solving our problem for us. Imagine currently, currently as we are speaking, the Nigerian government, you know, imported herbal remedies from from Madagascar for coronavirus, for example. Why can't we produce our own? And and secondly, look at the system again. Doctors are on strike, are on strike in a major pandemic. So, so, so even our own educational system has to be reformed. I'm telling you, it's not fit for purpose. Let me, let, let, let me, let me borrow the word of Professor Adija. We need to reform it as well. Reform the Almagri system. They're a massive human capital resource that Nigeria can really utilize to be the greatest country, and and of course continue. Uh, 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 so so building off that issue of of human capital development um and again coming back to the, this question that i was posing about the differences of opinion not just amongst the elite but amongst citizens we're seeing a lot of comments uh, that are coming in and i, I want to respond to this, to a few of these i'm going to put up one on the screen here i'll, I'll read it out there uh, this comes from Ami Matu. Uh, there must be a law to make fathers take responsibility for children that uh, breed carelessly. Mothers must be empowered to have a say in the decisions that affect their children's lives. And we received even before the conversation a lot of comments that weren't just, you know, talking about government and policy, which we've been talking about in this discussion up to this point. Um, but, but putting this back on, on families, on the structure of the family, and things of this nature, um, which is also one of these uh, critiques that has been presented, uh, and perha perhaps stereotypes that has been presented. So I, I, I want to get your reaction to this, because it, it's not just Anami Natu, but um, many uh, have shared this uh, similar sentiment. Um, so Hadiza, do you want to, I see you nodding your head, and then uh, Honorable Aishatu, off to you as well. So. Starting with you, Hadiza. Um, I'm not surprised by the comments. That's often the first. Like, I've seen comments that say, um, like, people should not be allowed to have children that they can't take care of. And while these are valid, because one of the things that I think, even though it's a male-dominated field, like, the women are hidden in the system. So it's true that maybe if you empower the rural community, because there is abject poverty in the rural communities as well, so it's really a question of what is the rural setup? A lot, there is a seasonal pattern to al before. They go, it's also called Chirani. You, they would set, go away when there is food shortage to go and do something else. So I think when people say, oh, um, ch fathers are having too many children or they're careless. While some of it may be true, I'm sure there are irresponsible fathers. It also misses out on the nuances of, of rural living. And, and what that tells me is how we're sitting and, and thinking to ours, oh, I've decided to have three or four children, so everyone should have three or four children. Yes, there are consequences, but I think we really need to get to the nuanced conversation of what happens, what rural living is really like. Um, and I'd leave it to Hannah and Honorable Aisha to, to give more information on that. Honorable Aisha, too, first to you, and then uh, Hannah, I saw your hand there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Yes, I used to come across a lot of such conversations that they are, the, the, the parents are irresponsible, they're having too many children that they cannot cater for. Okay, you have said that. It is true, they're having too many children. How do you enlighten them to stop having the children that they cannot cater for? You have to have a, an, a, you know, a group of people or agents that you can use to go back to them. And where do we get these agents? These are al -Majurais. should be our agents. To go back to the parents, yes. We cannot do it alone. We cannot be, do it by mere rhetoric. We cannot achieve that. Yes. And remember that talking about population control, it's, it's a big issue that sprang out even by some Islamic scholars. And you want to take on this issue head on and say and start castigating these parents that you want their cooperation. I, I think that is not the right way to go about it. Now the children are already with us. They are already a challenge. So let's take care of these children now first and then let them be the agents of our reorientation of the parents. Otherwise, we will still go back to square one. Now talking about the society, Please, what has the society done? Has the society given back to, to to the system? They have not. Is it that we are too poor? We are not. We have so many rich people that are not giving back to the society. Is it not a shame on the Muslim Ummah that we have a Belinda and a, 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 a Bill Gates Foundation that is sponsoring the Muslim girls to go to school? Is it not a shame that the Bill Foundation is sponsoring the cure for for child diseases like like polio in, in, in the Muslim environment, why can't they set up such foundations for an imagery for for this as you know, we have so many rich people that can do that. Mm -hmm. So what are we saying, please? Let us not sit down and fold our arms and believe that the government should do everything for us. No. We have to do our own part as members of the society and we have to take charge you know, and direct the government to where we want the government, you know, to act, and then take up the challenge squarely. Yeah, we, we heard that sentiment from a number of our yeah. viewers that uh, often have attended some of these panels with some of the big name politicians. And one of the questions that uh, many uh, have come through is, what are they doing on an individual level um, to deal with this, given the inequities that are already present in, in the country and in, in the region. And so that, that, that sense of, of frustration about the obligations that people have um, is, is, is very much present. So I'm glad you, you raised that. Uh, Hannah, you had your hand and wanted to get in on this and then gonna, uh, you've got a question. Yeah, go ahead, Hannah. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, I was quite surprised in my research to also find mothers who who took the decision or encouraged the decision that their children are involved as al Majirai. And I think it's again a question of the alternatives and, and the mother would definitely choose the best option for their children if, you know, if there's a choice. And I met mothers who told me, you know, I can't bear seeing my children go hungry at home. I don't have enough to give them to eat. So I prefer they go hungry elsewhere where I don't have to see it. And um, so that's an act of co compassion, I would say. Or mothers who said, you know, the worst thing for a child is to not get any education at all. And since Islamia and, and, and Boko um, need resources um, that might not be available, then at least get, let the child get a, get a good Quranic education. So I think it's always a question of bearing the alternatives in mind. Um, something that is not often mentioned, but I think that we should also bear in mind when talking about um, the, the conditions in rural areas is the really high divorce rate and the conditions that that creates for children from divorced marriages um, that often end up, you know, without a place where they can stay comfortably and then um, are involved as Alma today. Either parents or their fathers don't want them to be exposed to um, stepmothers or because the mothers can't take them to the new marriage they move into. So I think, yes, education on women, women's rights in divorce would be, would be important. Yeah, so, so one of the common uh, denominators in our conversation about Alma and Alma Jiranshi is poverty. Uh, even today, the issue of poverty has been brought up over and again and again. And uh, as a scholar that works on the issue of poverty in Nigeria, and uh, as majority of us, uh, the panelists and the viewers, uh, may be aware of, there is a linkage between the issue of poverty and corruption in Nigeria. And uh, one of the commitments of the current leadership in the country is to fight the issue of corruption. And uh, the issue of corruption and poverty in Northern Nigeria in particular 
uh, is being well established in the empirical literature. So the question to all the panelists is this, starting with uh, Honorable Aisha too. How could fixing the problem of and poverty impart what is seen as a problem of begging uh, uh, that is uh, associated with al Almajranshi and al Almajri schooling system? Sorry, I didn't get the last bit of what you said, but you asked. So the last bit of it is this. How could fixing the problem of corruption and poverty uh, impact or uh, drastically change what is known uh, as the problem of uh, as uh, uh, as the problem with al Almajranshi and al Almajri schooling system? Uh, because when you look at this system, people talk about begging, and begging is related to the problem of poverty. And we've been able to establish a nexus between poverty and the issue of corruption. So how should the focus on fighting and fixing the problem of corruption, particularly in Nigeria, how should fixing the problem of poverty, particularly in northern Nigeria, contribute to or eliminate some of the issues that have been characterized as negativity associated with the al schooling system and al Thank you very much. I, I, I want to differ a little from uh, uh, your own opinion in this issue. Uh, the issue of begging came about when the number became too unwieldy for the Malams to feed, even, you know, with, uh, with the coming of independence. As I said earlier, the source of the feeding was from the, the Emirate Councils, that is using the Betel Mals and the zakat, and then arms, because Islam encourages giving of arms, you know, and they were able to fit themselves comfortably, and they also gave back to the society. So when the number now became too unwieldy, and then there were, there were no more powers for the emirs, they could not give them any money, or they could not even buy food for them. So now, there was no system in place to take care of the malams and the almajri. So that was the beginning of our problem. So because the Malams were left on their own to cater for this huge number of children, they were, you know, relying on those that wanted to give charity as optional, you know, those that wanted to give them food, optional. Those that got farm products and gave them, it was also optional. So this was the beginning of the problem. It is not corruption. It's not corruption. It is because there was a lot of irresponsibility on the part of the community first and the leadership that could not cater for the malams and the almajri so the malam was left alone and to take such a decision is very easy when you find children that you know no uh, 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 nothing that you know to be patient with tonga they go out to, to 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 look for food they are not beggars they go to look for food to it. And you can see from even the clip that was shown by Anna that they want to go back to their moms and to continue learning. So the main aim of going there is to learn. And so they are not going out to beg for food. They are going out to get food so that they can stop the hunger and go back to their, their learning. So that is it. Now, when you talk about corruption, corruption now comes in a formal administration where there's supposed to be accountability and in that case we hold the 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 ubeck and subebs responsible because they have not told us where is the money for al -Majri. because the law has clearly stated that the money is supposed to take care of these categories of children including the al -Majri. so they have not told us where is the money for the al -Majri? as a minister i distributed funds for these quranic schools and i did it in a very big circle so that everybody is a witness and then the i i i held the malams accountable for what i have given them so that is accountability but now we do not know where the funds go to and that is where you can talk about corruption so actually yes there is corruption on one hand and there is irresponsibility on the other hand that has affected the almighty child honorable kakali I think we can just move on to Adisa before we have the Honorable. Yeah, Adisa, can you please jump uh, to this discussion? While poverty is 
a real actor. I think we need to remember that for many parents of al Majere, al Majere is a valid choice that they've made. And it's often an informed decision. And there's thought. It's not a feckless thing that they're doing. There's thought in the sending. There is what the locus of the system is the malam. The malam as the epicenter, the malam as a particular form of Muslim subjectivity that they aspire sons to be. So when they send a malam, it's because if he's in local parentis. They often have a relationship with the malam. And they also send as a cohort. So from one village, you might see four or five children. So the child is not sent alone. And this is not so odd when you realize the place of child fostering in West Africa. To send your child for better life chances is quite valid. So I'd like to say that while poverty is a factor, it's not only it's not the only factor. Some people actually send because they want their children to attend those schools. Another thing that I'd like to not, say is Nigeria in general is a very unequal society. Right? If you take away all the Almajiri beggars on the streets of northern Nigeria, there will still be a lot of beggars on the streets of northern Nigeria. So to make begging an issue of only Almajiranchi, I think that's really being disingenuous and unfair. And, and that's why I feel this begging ban, it's, it's a putting an elastoplast, it's putting a plaster on a compound fracture. Like taking paracetamol for, for, for a brain tumor. So you're like, okay, let's clear these children so we don't see them, so they don't affect our urban sensibilities, and let's okay. pretend they're all gone. A case of out of sight is out of mind. So don't be poor here. Don't be hungry here. Go and be poor and hungry in your villages. That's why we need to keep coming back to this. That's why we keep this. But if you must ban, ban has to be 20 years away from now. Ban has to be after you've taken so many steps and methods. Before years, you get to a ban, we're so well. Honestly, if if you must ban begging, begging in general, you can't ban. People don't want to buy beg because they like being in the hot sun and being abused by people. A lot of people beg because they have no other choice. So, what I am trying to say is really there is no quick fix solution. I wish we could wave a magic wand and everything would be fine. This requires slow painstaking deliberate work to get an education system that is befitting for northern nigeria in particular so so, so at this uh, let's go this yeah, because the the, the 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 focus of this question is on the issue of corruption how would elimination of corruption especially among the northern gov among the i mean i mean uh, in the political establishment in northern nigeria contribute to addressing the problems that are affecting, you know, the continued uh, progress of the Almajiri schooling system. Because politicians come to, come to tell us we've got to ban them because they perpetuate poverty, because they perpetuate nuisance. They give them all sorts of characterization. But it seems they don't get to talk about taking themselves to the responsibility of eliminating political corruption, of the abuse of public resources. Don't you think there should be a lot of conversation on this? So that if the politicians are able to do, be more accountable to the populace, they charging their political responsibility, fulfilling the responsibility of governor, it's very possible that the parents of the al Majirai will be economically sustainable enough to fund the education of their children in al Majiri school. Do you think there should be a lot of focus on this rather than focusing on banning and prescribing the system? I think that's where my research causes a lot of discomfort because i just realized why are al Majire always our focus of study maybe those who really need to be studied are western educated nigerians maybe we're the particular demographic to revert the lens back on so and that's why i like hansen i think it's 2016 who calls us a parasitic predator class very harsh words i don't have i'm not a scholar of corruption I just know that corruption affects every facet of our lives. It affects our access to healthcare, it affects our access to education, it affects security. So yes, if we can solve the issue of corruption, then that might help. But I don't even blame politicians in that way. Our politicians are us. We talk about politicians as if they are this special group of people. They are honorable, they are anti Aisha Duku. These are people like us who care. So what is it about the system? that allows these things to happen. It's not individuals. It's never been about individuals. People do what they can get away with. So it's going back to fixing that 
thing that allows people to act with impunity. Our politicians are us. They are my brothers and aunties and uncles. Mm -hmm. The importance so, yes. of the, in Thank the you. incentive system, the structural, the structural elements. I think that's really important um, in this discussion. So we are coming up against uh, time now. Um, and yeah, go ahead, Honorable oh. Aishatu, and then uh, and then we're going to start to get our, yeah. our sort of last words and, and our, our way forward. So Honorable Aishatu, I saw your hand uh, to you. Thank you very much. I want to refer to Dr. Zalili's. Uh, the issue of burning the Almadri system does not even arise. It doesn't even arise because the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria clearly, you know, in Chapter 3, Section 3 on and that's it stipulates that any person who became a citizen of Nigeria by birth, registration or naturalization under the provision of any other constitution shall continue to be a citizen of Nigeria under this constitution. And section 41 says every citizen of Nigeria is entitled to move freely throughout Nigeria and to reside in any part thereof. And no citizen of Nigeria shall be expelled from Nigeria or refuse entry or exit therefrom. With this development, one can observe that the fundamental rights to freedom of movement, like other rights under the 1999 Constitution, might be derogated from or abridged in defense of public health, as we have seen in the uh, corona issue, public safety or public morality. So the Constitution has given the Almighty Child the protection to go anywhere in this country. So the issue of banning does not arise. And then the constitution again allows for freedom of association. So if these madams want to associate freely and bring children under their custody to learn the Quran, I think nobody has any right unless we go back to the constitution and the process of repealing an act is getting two thirds of the states of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to come together to say, no, we don't want this law. That is the only way we can ban the Almadri system. Otherwise, it is, it is a fact that it is not possible to ban it. Now, uh, uh, Peter, you said now to the solutions. Before the solutions, I had mentioned earlier that we have to understand some facts, that we cannot take them back to the basic education system because the system is already suffering in its own way. It cannot take this large population of these children. Two, we need a certain category of manpower to develop the economy of Nigeria. And these Almajira is a very good source of this manpower if we train them and we put them in the right way. Three, we need to put the, the, the Malams and the owners of these Sangaya and Almajira schools to bring the solution. We need to put them at the forefront. Let them be the ones to bring the solution. If the federal government wants to ban this system, let them ask the, 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 the sheikhs and the malams to, to come up with a solution on how to even ban it, if they so wish to ban it. And I believe it is not even going to be banned because it is a system that is very, very productive as it is today. Secondly, we have got best practices from countries all over the world. We've been to Indonesia, Malaysia. It, we have seen, even here in Sudan, you know, we have seen best practices. Now, as I said, Indonesia, as at 2008, had 30 million children that had not been integrated. Now they have less than 1%. So what are we doing in Nigeria? We can do it. We can do it because we have the knowledge, you know, to do it. Now, finally, let us involve all stakeholders. Let not just one particular group of people who feel they are experts and they have the authority to talk on the Almighty because they are poor, they are, uh, you know, they, they have no money. So everybody is now becomes a stakeholder to talk about the future of over 30 million children. I, 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 I believe that is the only way, you know, we can, we can solve this issue. And as Hadisa said, it has to be a painstaking uh, activity. It cannot be done overnight. But now as it is, let us provide funding and how to take care of their welfare. We can do it. We have seen in the Ministry of Humanitarian you know, Development, we have seen in the UBE that there are funds for the Almadri because they are children of Nigeria. The Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs should provide feeding for them. And the UBE law has provided funds for the Almadri. So let us... System, and I think it raises questions about the language in which conversations are being held. It raises questions about is online feasible? You know, we've, we've seen it 
in real life that you know having good connectivity is an issue that um, that that needs to address if a, an equitable conversation should be possible. Um, and I think that including stakeholders of the system in in the conversation also would hopefully help humanize um, the perception that people have of them and and um, lead to a more compassionate response if they are seen not just as these figures that are being talked about, but actual people with dreams and hopes and, and ideas. Yeah, that's so th thank you for that, Hannah. You mentioned the issues of connectivity and, and every, all, I'm sure all of our audience saw today that our challenges with connectivity and, and bringing in callers. And I, I think it, it also brings up a larger issue in this COVID-19 era where uh, civil society and activism has, has rolled into virtual activism. And, and, and we already know that uh, activism can be oftentimes driven by the elites itself, as Hadiza has mentioned. Um, perhaps we're even we're even shrinking that number even more with our, our virtual activism and in, in the importance of broadening that conversation. Thanks for that, Hana. Um, uh, to you, uh, Honorable Kakale, um, what is your way forward? Issue of connectivity. Connectivity. <laughs> oh, there there we go, Honorable Kakale. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I, I have having some connection problems here. No worries. So, what is your way forward? What What are the next steps so that we're not having this My conversation next steps, in ten next years? Steps, <laughs> uh, yeah, ne next steps uh, is uh, recognize the Almagris system as of education, then disaggregate the Almagris that we think we have currently on our streets. You know, there are these who are in school, there are these who are from 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 homes that uh, turn out due to poverty. There are these migrant children, and there are these other ones, you know, that, that, that have been trafficked by some other. Uh, so this is a huge social, uh, socio-economic problem. But what, let me let, let, let me say it here: we need a strong private-public partnership. The government and the state, with all their resources, cannot solve the problem actually alone. We need tax force, just like the COVID-19 tax force. It tax force for Almagri or for the education system in Nigeria. We need to have the system recognized. Number two, the UBE Act should be implemented to the latter. The Act provides for funds, 2% of the consumer revenue. Even this year, 100, more than 100 billion naira was uh, for that. States should, 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 should the step. On the legislature, as we do, deepen and make sure that the decisions are applied. And what we need to allow or to create new ones, we will continue to push for that. And finally, definitely, we have the largest out of uh, Nigerian and uh, Almagri children and many others as a human capital resource for Nigeria. There uh, is a blessing with that population. Nigeria has the largest economy in Africa. We can do more if we spice up these children with skills. They will be self employed, employed. they will be solving problems, they will have technical education. And and, and 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 they can they can, they can for themselves for the country. Quickly on 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 the models, I I, I, I want to also recognize the my state government, that's the state government, uh, leadership of governor that has been I mean was Tambo, that has been working on the model of uh, uh, of Indonesia model. They've taken 30 million children out of school, uh, which uh, uh, the the I shall mention, but the uh, we we are going uh, with the emergency system in in, 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 in in the state and we hope you know we continue to to exist them and see how we can really uh, tailor it to the needs of our, our, our state of, of the country i mean and all of the country uh i think this uh my, my closing moment i wanted to talk a, a bit about corruption but i don't know whether that is time uh, well, we, uh, yes. we, we got a moment, just a brief brief word on that. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. The federal government, the federal government has, has 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 done a lot to fight corruption, but still there's systemic corruption that exists in this country. Uh, the 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 structural cages and the gaps and the loopholes that allow systems, agencies, departments to be corrupt have not been taken care of. Mega corruption, yes, a lot has been done, but up till today, every day. Issues of corruption and lack of accountability are, are, are all over the place. And unless we strengthen institutions, 
always ask questions and demand accountability won't be able to 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 get like what we are doing here on this leadership of africa we i really want to commend you it's one of those you know building uh, uh institutions to ask questions and and, and secondly another thing that really caused corruption in this country is the size of our budget we have a small budget nigeria is a rich country a 500 billion dollar economy by gdp but our budget is only 30 billion dollars the bill budget is a, is it's 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 like a diabetic economy you know having poverty in the midst of plenty you know in diabetes a patient has a lot in his system but his cells cannot use it you know so we have to also expand the budget expand ways that government will be able to ramp up resources to fund critical infrastructure and areas of social and human uh, uh, development but a thirty dollar, a thirty billion dollar budget for a two hundred million uh, country, you know, the, the the budget to beat GDP ratio is one of the lowest in in, in, in Africa. So it also fuels corruption. Another example I want to give aside is this issue of COVID. Now a lot of civil servants have been asked to stay home. But even with that, you know, government has been running. So what does that? Tell us that which we need to a real system. Thank you, Honorable Kali. So, so thank you very much. Thank mm. you. And uh, last word to you on our on our panel, Hadiza. I just want to add that nothing, no solution that we're going to come up with hasn't been done in the past. Mm -hmm. So rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, let's go back. To what has existed there has been excellent initiative by espin on the iqte there's also the best project there are pockets of excellence so i know somewhere like in mina sheikh nafu's children don't beg they access western education i know sheikh tahir Bauchi has also done that i know in mina um sheikh um nuruddin lemu has coach for weekend schooling so there are pockets of excellence that we can can blow up. Another thing that I'd like to say is I love when I hear Sokoto and other places really trialing new things. But one of the things I'd like to say is the Northern Governors Forum need to have a Northern strategic education reform. It needs to be joined up. They need to champion it with the energy that they put into a ban. That's the energy that they need to bring into reform. And going back to why I'm saying nothing new is being offered. This morning, I woke up to a list of recommendations from my 75-year-old mother who has been a policymaker. And I read, I'm like, God, we've been doing this so long. <laughs> Same if we implemented her recommendations, it would work. So what that tells me as a new scholar is that we stand on the soldiers of giants. We're not doing anything new. They've done it in the past. We only need people to really champion it and move it forward. <laughs> I think that's a, a really lovely summation of, of, of many of the things we've talked about as well in this conversation. The fact that we that there is a legal framework involved. There is finance already there. There are a lot of solutions on the table. But this issue of implementation of political will, of, of, of community will is, is really is really critical. Uh, Ghana, uh, I'll invite you to make your final comments and and uh, uh, and uh, do our vote of, of thanks. I mean, I just want to thank uh, all of our panelists uh, for doing uh, justice uh, to the topic of discussion today. Uh, we also want to thank uh, the participants, uh, those who participated via Zoom, and those uh, who participated uh, via YouTube. Uh, we also want to apologize uh, to those uh, who wanted to call in, but uh, were unable to do so due to one technical problem or the problem of internet, uh, internet connectivity. Uh, we apologize for some of these inadequacies, which are not necessarily from us. Uh, to us, the leaders of Africa, the conversation does not end with this panel discussion. The conversation continues in our different platforms, and uh, be rest assured that our interest at the leaders of Africa is to support and foster the continued development of Africa and enlist it as one of the most developed continents in the world. And in doing this, we privilege critical conversations such as this. And we also uh, have other programs that we run at the Leaders of Africa, including capacity building for top-notch educational system in different African countries. We've been supporting the development of the capacity of African faculty members to go virtual 
Uh, we've organized our training programs for no less than uh, 150 faculty members from different African countries on how they can leverage learning management system and educational technology in their transition to online learning. We are a partner in the development of Africa, and uh, we look for your continuous support of the projects and activities of the leaders of Africa. Thank Let you. the conversation continue, please. Absolutely, and on, on my half, uh, on my behalf, thank you all, to all of our panelists. We really appreciated your comments, and again, hopefully, the discussion will not be taking place in the same, at least in the same way, in in ten years, uh, given all of the solution on the table. Um, so, yeah. thank you. Thank you and for thank organizing. You. And thank you for joining us today on Leaders of Africa Live. We will continue to follow all of the developments on the ground, including government policy, debates within the ruling party, debate uh, between the opposition and the ruling party, and all of the different solutions that we've talked about in terms of the implementation. So as Ghana said, let us continue this conversation. Our next conversation will be coming up in a number of weeks. To hear first, remember to subscribe to our newsletter or our new YouTube channel, like our Facebook or LinkedIn page, or join our Telegram app. Again, thank you for joining us and for all of your contributions before today's session and also during the session. We look forward to seeing you again. Until next time.